Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. What is Joe Biden's strategic playbook against China, and why does it look so much like Trump's playbook? Let's get to the bottom line. One of President Joe Biden's big campaign promises was that he was going to reverse the hostility to China coming from former President Donald Trump. But two months into his presidency, Biden hasn't reversed a single one of the former president's policies. In fact, he's doubled down. U.S. officials still label the abuse of China's Muslims in Xinjiang province as genocide, still condemn the crackdown in Hong Kong, still reject China's claims in the South China Sea. Huawei is still on the U.S. communications chopping block. Last week, Biden met with leaders in the first quad meeting with heads of government from India, Australia and Japan, but not China. And this week, he sent his two top officials, the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense, or the carrot and the stick, to visit several countries in Asia. But again, not China. There will be a meeting with Chinese officials later in Alaska, but the message is clear. Biden is building a grand contain China coalition. So how is China taking all this in? And will this track be effective? Today, we're talking to Deborah Lair, who was involved in the accession of China to the World Trade Organization 20 years ago and was one of the founders of the U.S.-China Strategic Economic Dialogue. And today, she's the CEO of Baselina, a consultancy on China and the Middle East based here in Washington. She is also executive director of the Paulson Institute. And Randy Shriver, who served in the Trump administration as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs. He is the co-founder and chairman of the Project 2049 Institute, which works to advance U.S. interests in Asia. So much uh, thank you to both of you for, for talking with us today. Let me just start out with you, Deborah, as we sort of look at U.S.-China relations. And, and is China a foe? Is it a friend? Do we collaborate? How do we get that mix right in describing where our relationship should be today? Well, that's obviously a huge question, but I think it's very important to think of this not in military terms, but maybe in more business-like terms. We often think of it as a zero-plus, a zero-sum game. And when you think in military terms, there's always a winner and a loser. But in the case of dealing with China, in some cases, they're a competitor. In some cases, we are aligning ourselves with them on issues perhaps like climate change and other things. And in some cases, it's a little bit in between. It's kind of like with investment banks, where one day Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan might be competing, and in another instance, they might be cooperating on a project. So we need to set up a framework that can accommodate those different kinds of relationships. Randy, you know, we've had four years of the Trump administration. You served in the Trump administration. Now we're at an inflection point politically. But when it comes to these strategic questions, is there continuity between Trump and Biden? What what is going to continue? What needs to be changed um, as you see it? I do think we'll see a lot more continuity than people might otherwise expect. And one of the reasons is because I, I think the Trump administration actually was uh, representing continuity in a lot of ways, particularly in my portfolio on the military and security side. Uh, President Trump was certainly different, uh, unorthodox, unconventional, whatever your term of art is. Um, but in many ways, the free and open Indo-Pacific policy at the Department of Defense was really set on its course and trajectory in the Obama administration with the pivot rebalance to Asia. So I think our policies are being driven by, by China's growth, its behavior, the pressure they're putting on allies and friends. And we're responding to that to try to preserve the free and open qualities of the region. And so I do think there will be continuity, as there was uh, more so than I think a lot of people realize, even in the last administration. I mean, Randy, you know, I've looked at a lot of material that, that PLA analysts have written, People's Liberation Army analysts have written about the United States that see particularly the last four years as one where the U.S. was very tough on its allies, was very skeptical of international institutions, on the trade front, walked away from things like the TPP. And in their eyes, they saw America in strategic contraction. That, therefore, in their eyes, then justified a lot of what they've been doing to expand it. How is that PLA analyst wrong? Well, I think it's more complicated than that. I think in many ways the U.S. was willing to stand up to China in the military sphere in ways that maybe previous administrations weren't. We certainly saw a greater number of freedom of navigation operations. We saw more activity in the Taiwan Strait. We saw more arms sales to Taiwan. We saw more cooperation with Japan on the military and security side as we sort of normalized that alliance. But yes, there were certain particularly pet issues of the president himself, like burden sharing, that probably sent the mixed signals uh, that, that led some Chinese analysts to think we were in decline or this America first meant America only. And I, and I think it was just more complicated than that. And they're going to see, I think, in the Biden administration, 
um, real opportunities to uh, to try to right the ship, but they're not going to uh, be op welcomed with open arms in all instances because their behavior needs to change for that to take place. Yeah, but I just mentioned that Huawei is on the chopping block in the United States. You know, there's there's trade, there's technology. There are a lot of non-military dimensions to the U.S.-China relationship. There are, you know, big challenges out there on, on climate, on a whole variety of fronts that kind of these large transnational questions. How do you think the U.S. is situated today in terms of either competing or collaborating with China on trade, on climate, on terrorism? Right. Obviously, those are all huge issues. And let's take technology just to begin with. That is really at the core of a lot of the tensions that we have with China. And part of the issue is a focus on how we ensure that our companies are the most innovative in the world and what's in our interests. And in doing that, part of it is they need to be able to commercialize their technologies in the world's largest consumer market, and that's China. And so when it wait, comes wait, I just want to stop you. So the world's largest consumer market today is China. Yes, it is. I mean, is. that's something I just couldn't let drug go. So that's a punctuation point. It is a punctuation okay. point. And it'd be very difficult for us to remain competitive in some of the areas that we do without an ability to commercialize these technologies in China. So we need to think very carefully about what our national security policies are and our focus on the national security issues around supply chain and make sure that while we're very protective of those that are core to national security, that we're not making the, the field so large that we're capturing technologies that in some instances can be provided by some of our competitors in other countries. So how do you do that? I mean, I happen to be a fan of TikTok. Mm -hmm. And TikTok was one of these issues that was raised in the last administration and being a technology that would create vulnerability around communications and data to Chinese government sources. And I think I understand part of that is that any Chinese company is subject to their national security law, their national intelligence law. So every company that does business in the U.S. and the technology front is a potential threat. How do you balance that with the fact that you need access to their economy? I mean, your thoughts on that? I would like to get Randy's as well. Well, and those are two different issues, right? I mean, one of it is how do we allow Chinese companies to operate in the United States? And some of the issues that the Chinese tech companies face are similar to the, the issues that our large tech companies face. How do we protect data? How do we protect children's access to technology and these kinds of things? Some are unique to China, like mm. TikTok, like WeChat. How do you protect data that is collected about the American consumer and not have it used in China, particularly if it's being collected in circles that perhaps, whether it's um, young military who are using TikTok and show where they might be, that's a vulnerability. So right? it's a serious issue. And so it I is mean, a serious issue. I thought you were going to laugh about it, but it's a serious issue. No, I think it is a serious issue, but I think there are also ways to protect that. And one of the ways is to also start looking, and this I think goes to the larger issue of one of Biden's strategies when it comes to dealing with China, is how we start to deal with like-minded democracies in creating rules around technology. And this is one of the areas where the trade world really has fallen behind. Mm -hmm. This is one of the areas where the World Trade Organization has not lived up to its mission, which is to reflect what today's modern trading world looks like. Randy, your thoughts? Well, I think Deborah's exactly right, uh, particularly working with like-minded partners and fellow democracies. And I think uh, uh, Kirk Campbell in the Biden administration has used the term techno uh, alliance among democracies. And I think that's the right way to think about it. But but overall, you know, we need to think about both the defense and the offense side, the defense, protecting technology, getting friends and allies to do the same, making sure that our supply chains are secure and there's integrity, particularly in the critical supply chains. Uh, but also the off offensive side, we have to out innovate and we have mm -hmm. to maintain competitive edge. And the problem is those bleed into one another. Uh, those that, that are part of our innovation uh, economy are also benefiting from the China market. So these sort of blend into one another. So it, it requires a, a vigilance and requires a level of uh, attention that uh, is, is going to be challenging for any administration. Is there anything that America and its allies should be doing with response to Hong Kong, not only because of Hong Kong, but because of the inaction is being read by China as a green flag on doing more on Taiwan? Well, I think keeping pressure on CCP leadership because of their actions on, Taiwan, uh, on uh, Hong Kong and in Xinjiang, and pressure in a variety of ways, including sanctions. I think the, the use of global Minitsky, the individual sanctions, 
uh, is is potentially helpful. The Magnitsky Act. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but but remember, Taiwan is is fundamentally different in in some important ways. Uh, China exerts sovereignty over Hong Kong and Xinjiang. They claim sovereignty over Taiwan, but they don't control it. They don't run it. And for the benefit of the people of Taiwan, there's 80 nautical miles of water in between. So they run their own affairs. They have a thriving democracy, a thriving economy. They probably set the global standard on handling coronavirus and some, some people that we could really learn from and benefit from their example. So Taiwan has different advantages to be able mm. to deal with the PRC's pressure, but that doesn't mean uh, we step aside and are completely a, an uninterested or disinterested party. We have obligations under the Taiwan Relations Act that we try to implement faithfully and, and ensure that Taiwan is able to continue to survive in its current status or better. Deb, this week I interviewed uh, the new Japan ambassador to the United States, Koji Tomita. And I, I asked Ambassador Tomita to sort of to, to, to kind of talk about the TPP at the beginning of the TPP negotiation process. You know, he disagreed with me on this, but I sort of saw Japan mm -hmm. as the laggard, you know, as the most reluctant to kind of come along. Now Japan is sort of the leader of the TPP, which mm -hmm. the America, um, yeah. you know, the United States walked away from. China wants to be in the TPP, and China's cutting trade deals all over the world. Where is the United States? Are, are we playing our hand right when it comes to trade? Because that's also part of the question of how you conduct foreign policy. Um, and I'll just tag on, you know, with regards to Hong Kong and Xinjiang, should, you know, do you look, have any concern about all of the trade deals that China is cutting with other countries and why they're not making China pay a price for some of its behavior? Yeah, you're absolutely right. China has been very active when it has come to trade. They have, in the last two years, completed the world's largest regional trade agreement, which was with a number of our allies, including Japan and Korea. They are negotiating a free trade agreement with New Zealand. They have started a free trade agreement with Japan and Korea. They concluded a major investment agreement last year with um, the Europeans. And they just launched a customs union with Eastern Europe. And they're claiming that they're going to start a free trade agreement with the Gulf countries. So, so is there anything in and the U.S. column? in the meantime, column? nothing in the U.S. <laughs> column. We're still waiting for uh, the U.S. trade representative to get confirmed. Trade is not at the top of the agenda, and as the administration is looking at their assessment of China policy, we have not heard that trade is going to play a major role. There is no discussion at the moment about the U.S. joining or rejoining, as it may be, TPP. And it's really a shame. And if we're going to wait to do all of this through the WTO, we're going to be waiting a long time, because the WTO, I think all would agree, needs a major reform. So, Randy, how do you respond to that? Because part of playing a full deck, if you will, is the security dimension. Absolutely. We seem to have siloed these off, saying, well, we can play the security card at some levels, but not play the economic or the trade one. It, it, is that smart? It's a problem. And it, I think the uh, Trump administration, one of my uh, criticisms, even though I served in it, was uh, coming out of the gates strong on the military. We're going to raise defense budgets and one of the first actions pulling out of TPP. And even worse, we did a repeal and not a replace. We said we were going to do bilateral trade agreements, and then it lagged for years. On the positive side, the previous administration worked with the Congress on the BUILD Act and looked at creative ways to be an enabler for U.S. foreign investment into mm -hmm. uh, critical regions like Southeast Asia. That's sort of coming online and getting underway. So really, the, the lead of U.S. economic policy has been our private investment overseas. And, I, I'm more optimistic there than on the trade liberalization, which the politics here have just uh, just been decimated on both sides of the aisle. Vladimir Putin has been out there saying uh, that the nation that controls AI will control the future. And, and uh, when you look at 5G, in which there's been such a contentious battle already between uh, the United States and some parts of the world over Huawei, uh, and its 5G role, or you look at, and 5G in a way is really a holding place to talk about data, talk about quantum uh, uh, computing, talk about um, uh, artificial intelligence and, and whatnot. That whole realm is just a strategic leap technologically in some ways, and China plays a big role. Is the United States doing enough in that area um, to base, because that's partly industrial policy, it's partly commercial innovation, but are we doing enough to, to, to match, if you will, what the Chinese are doing. Randy? My sense is we're a little bit slow out of the gate. And uh, I think... That's a big statement. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I you're saying that as a former Pentagon official, 
you're worried. Yeah, I'm also encouraged that we're focusing on the, the challenge and we're thinking about what we need to do to be more competitive in this space. And we're understanding what the Chinese are doing at a, at a more sophisticated level as well. Uh, in terms of building the emerging technologies out, the Chinese are doing quite well. When it comes to application and building systems of systems on the military side, it's a lot less clear. Mm. So uh, they may have a bit of a, a head start on the uh, just the R&D and the emerging technologies. Uh, when it comes to applications, I'm still confident we can maintain a competitive edge, but we've got to we got to be on the game here. Deborah, you know this world well. I mean, I'd be interested mm -hmm. to know what you think about this. I mean, wh the way Randy just described it, he really described us as peers. Not mm -hmm. you know maybe the U.S. will keep with lead, but he couldn't have described us as thinking about it. And the China's already deploying. Well, I, I totally agree with Randy, but I would add on the commercial front, I do think they're starting to compete with us. And where the Chinese have been smart, and where we need to be careful is let's take climate. Right. Climate is identified as a big area of potential cooperation, whereas I think actually it's going to be the area of conflict. Because again, at the core of what we are looking at on climate is technology. And if you look at clean tech, whether it's batteries that are used in EVs and other materials, the lithium ion batteries, whether it's new energy vehicles, China leapfrog technologies, focused on these and have done a great job commercializing them at home and now we're exporting them abroad. And we are going to be competing in these areas. And so they are taking us on directly in industries where we've dominated, not just now competing in China, but also we're competing in the Middle East, we're competing in Latin America for these products. And so I do think we need to have a very hmm. good focus on how we support our innovative industries, AI, we are ahead, and how we help them commercialize and how we find a way to make sure that for applications that are not a threat to national security, we can um, commercialize them in China. Uh, so you, you're confident, you're optimistic. Well, I'm optimistic in that I believe that the U.S. can outcompete China if our industries are given that opportunity. I'm just interested in how Biden sees Xi Jinping and his ability to influence that leader's decisions versus Xi Jinping looking at Joe Biden and our toxic political situation today. Randy, do you have thoughts on that? Well, these are great questions. Um, the second part first, how does she and other CCP leaders look at the United States? I think they look at it with some confusion and uh, are about to have some expectations dashed. I, I did a lot of sort of track one and a half, track two work even after I left the administration. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese were very hopeful for a reset or return to normal. Um, they were hopeful that the Trump administration was an aberration. And it may have been an aberration in rhetoric and tone, uh, but I think, again, the roots of U.S.-China strategic competition are, are more foundational now. Where the American public has very negative views of China that's reflected in all the polling. The Congress is very activist on, on China. So I think they're going to be dealing with a United States that's going to take tougher stances across the board. Uh, even though they're dealing with a very different leader on our side, who's obviously a very experienced hand, having served as vice president and, and uh, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee as chair. Um, how, mm. how Biden and, and the U.S. now look at Xi, I think he's revealed himself quite a bit over the last uh, few years, um, everything from his domestic moves and political moves to make mm. himself president for life, but also has his ambitions in the region. You know, a few years ago, we heard about Asia for Asians, and that seems to be... Uh, acted out now in a lot of their more assertive behavior and uh, expansive illegal sovereignty claims. So I think there's a pretty clear understanding of where Xi Jinping wants to go. He's very clear about the great rejuvenization and where he wants China to be by the midpoint of the century, 2049. Deborah, your thoughts? I completely agree with Randy. I think one of the areas where the Democrats and the Republicans do come together, maybe the only area, is on China. Hmm. And it looks like we're going to see a significant number of bills again in this administration, which in some ways it's going to force the administration to determine if it's following foreign policy coming from the Hill or if it's going to be ahead of them and guiding what foreign and trade policy are going to be. And for the Chinese, I do think they were looking for a reset, and Randy's right. They're not going to see that because everything that we're seeing coming out of Biden is very similar, mm. at least in the issues that they've identified as Trump. The remedies, I'm sure, will be very different. So let me, let me just push you a little bit further on that, mm -hmm. because I agree 
that the puffery and the posture and the uh, statements on of concern about China uh, reach across party aisles, and there's a lot of continuity there. Where I don't see consensus is on the strategy of what to do, mm -hmm. and par particularly when it comes to muscling up on Amera's science strategy, uh, you know, doubling the National Science Foundation budget, looking at what you kind of do on kind of returning the United States back to this innovation powerhouse that really drove, you know, what we saw in Silicon Valley, but in so many other areas, the biotech revolution, et cetera, et cetera. You know, China's now appear there. And so part of the question is you see diminishing investment by the U.S., increasing investment by our rivals in the world. So is that a key part? Am I wrong, or does that need to be a part of the response? Because I don't see the consensus behind that yet. Well, I think that's also the difference between the Congress and the administration, right? Every At the end of the last Congress, there were over 500 bills focused on China. So it's every congressman has its issue, their issue that they're focused on, whether it's delisting, whether it's stopping Chinese students from studying in the United States, whatever it might mm. be. The administration needs to, in my view, be ahead of where the Congress is in putting together a whole strategy across all of these issues, whether it's what is the role of students studying in the U.S. If you look at artificial intelligence, for example, the majority of foreign workers who are in U.S. firms, U.S. AI, AI mm -hmm. firms, are Chinese. They are part of the reason we are so successful in artificial intelligence. Do we continue to keep this open mm. to them as a market for studying and working. Right. These are fundamental questions I think the administration is Randy, I'm going to be unfair to you and give you a minute to ask a very tough question, <laughs> which is we haven't talked about North Korea today. We have talked a little bit about climate. I've seen China essentially saying, hey, you want our help on North Korea? You want our help on China? You want our help on Myanmar? Here's what the costs were going to be. Leave us alone on these other areas. What is your prognosis on whether we are going to get any credible support from China on these other uh, big, I mean, North Korea is not just North Korea, it's a transnational global uh, nuclear threat. So as you look at that, are, do, you, do you have any optimism? Uh, unfortunately, not much. Um, you know, North Korea is important enough to the Chinese and the, the, the Korean Peninsula is important enough that we shouldn't have to be bidding for their cooperation. So I suspect it's really more interest driven and they're trying to see if they can exact a price from us for coming to the table. But our, our experiences over the last several administrations have been uh, pretty mixed, um, willing to come to the table, but think about uh, outcomes differently, think about priorities differently. Um, by the time uh, the, the Trump administration closed, uh, it was not only a lack of cooperation, uh, mm. the Chinese were basically enabling North Korean illegal illicit shipping in their territorial waters to evade the sanctions. So it was. Uh, it was enabling the North Koreans, making those challenges much harder. So I think it's worth, you know, it's worth continuing to work with them on it. Any outcome that's that's achieved through diplomacy has to involve the Chinese, um, but it, it's going to be a slog. I love that we're not finishing this show with, on a false positive note. Uh, so <laughs> I want to thank you both, veteran China experts Deborah Lair, chief exec executive of Vaselina Consulting, uh, and also executive director of the Paulson Institute, and Randy Shriver, former Pentagon and State Department official for Asia. Thank you both for being with us today. Thanks. So what's the bottom line? Remember Dr. Strange? He's the magical superhero from the comic books that can reverse time. Well, with China policy, maybe President Joe Biden is trying to be Dr. Strange. 20 years ago, America wanted to seduce China and change its core character by bringing it into the World Trade Organization and creating trillions of dollars of new wealth. America consciously shifted jobs and manufacturing to China, making a lot of Chinese rich, but also hollowing out America's middle class. Now China realizes that with great wealth comes great power, and it can push countries around, including the United States. The only problem is now, America's calling. Ring, ring, hello, we want our jobs back. It also wants China to stay within the lines it drew for it decades ago and to respect America's dominance. Well, good luck with that. Biden can try to reverse time and put the genie back in the bottle, but that strategy hardly ever works. What could actually work is if the United States would reinvest in itself, investing in science, in education, infrastructure, a smart industrial policy for the future. When America used to do that, it didn't have to worry about China or any other competition. And that's the bottom line.